Please focus on high power, high frequency vacuum, electronic devices, optical terahertz amplifiers, electron beam dynamics, advanced accelerator pump, okay. A lot of stuff. Accelerator, basically. Um, so, for, I'll just let him take it away on exploring B-wave interactions in pursuit of next generation accelerators. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you for not freaking. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so yes, and thank you very much for having me here to present uh, your colloquium. Um, so uh, today I'll be talking a little bit about our work, in, in particular focusing on the terahertz frequency range and, and trying to uh, really develop the next uh, generation of accelerators. Of course, a lot of people have contributed to the various projects um, uh, that I'll be presenting today. Um, we have a, a rather large group of uh, people or focused on arc accelerators in general, and in, in particular, a couple names uh, uh, to point out, Sammy Tintawi, who works uh, on a lot of these projects with me. Uh, Michael Fazio will provide a little bit of the intro material for this talk. <coughs> and then the student, uh, students, postdocs, and staff who are, are, are contributing to the work. <coughs> okay, so I'll begin with a brief motivation about why uh, accelerators are interesting, why they uh, are very impactful for society, and in particular, why we're interested in Slack, um, and then I'll give you a brief history uh, of where they came from and how they work, um, and then talk about the performance that's possible with terahertz accelerators, the work that we're doing in terms of trying to be able to build them because of the very high frequency that they're at, um, and then some of the initial experiments um, that are going on uh, right now. So the motivation uh, for accelerators is really that they're a tool uh, for driving uh, scientific discovery. Um, we all know about the history of accelerators for uh, high energy physics, uh, but it's Slack now that's uh, shifted uh, more towards ultra fast science. Uh, and there's two really great examples that are in operation right now. Uh, on the left, I'm showing the LCLS X ray free electron laser. Uh, so it's a kilometer scale facility that generates 10 GB uh, electron bunches and then uses those electron bunches to make very fast uh, bursts of X rays, but then uh, study materials down here. Uh, experimental halls. And then on the right, at a very different scale, you have another uh, accelerator that's producing very short bunches of electrons. And you use those electrons to probe the materials directly with diffraction. Um, so this thing is a few meters long. The, the detectors themselves are off the camera and to the right. But it fits in an area that's actually quite a bit smaller than this room. So you see that we're, we're spanning a very long range, but actually it's the same technology that's driving both of these machines. Uh, they're both driven by normal conducting uh, accelerating structures in the S-band frequency range, so around 3 gigahertz. And the, the work that we're doing is really focused on developing that next generation and trying to improve it uh, and really bring about new performance that can lead to new scientific discoveries. So Slack right now is really focused on uh, pushing that uh, time resolution frontier. I think that everyone is probably familiar with the photograph showing up here on the right. It was one of the first motion pictures actually capturing a horse as it was running. And it was actually a question of solving a debate about whether or not all four feet of the horse were off the ground at the same time. And as you can see, with a short burst of a photograph, you're actually able to visualize that um, the, the horse leaves the ground completely. Now what we're trying to do is push that flash photography down onto shorter and shorter time scales. So from physical motion on the scale of seconds and milliseconds, you're talking about uh, pushing that frontier first onto the scale of electronics, nanoseconds, that's already where typical X-ray facilities operate. And then with free electron lasers, you're pushing down below the picosecond scale onto atomic motion. And if you can get to the femtosecond scale, really one femtosecond long, you're talking about electronic motion. So what is the general approach uh, that we are using uh, to achieve this? Well, we're trying to dramatically improve the gradient uh, of our accelerators. That's the amount of energy that you gain per meter of the structure. And it has a lot of impacts on the quality of the electron beams that you can accelerate, how long those electron beams are going to be, and how far you need to uh, travel before you can gain sufficient energy for your experiments. And so we're trying to push that gradient by pushing the frequency, and I'll talk about why we think that's doable. But as you push the frequency, the sources that we use to power these accelerators also need to change dramatically. And so we're going from traditional klystrons that produce tens of megawatts of power for microsecond time scales, and we're trying to push that onto uh, a very different frequency range, and most likely do that with um, laser-based methods, because it provides some really 
intrinsic advantages in terms of synchronization and timing uh, for these kinds of experiments. So this has been a very uh, rapidly evolving field that has developed over the last few years in terms of terahertz acceleration. And there have already been some very key demonstrations in terms of acceleration, uh, photo emission and acceleration, very high gradients established, uh, beamline instruments that are, for example, like a, a transverse deflectors to map out the structure of your electron bunches. And now we're trying to push for independent systems that can produce usable electron bunches uh, at high gradients. Um, and it's a very active field with many different national labs and universities that are participating in it. So it's a really exciting time, I think, to be uh, involved in this work. But at the end of the day, what's the impact that, that we can deliver? Um, so today, what we're doing is we're actually delivering very precise beam diagnostics and beam manipulation with femtosecond scale resolution. And we're doing this on beam lines for user facilities now. Uh, the next step, I think, in this work is talking about impacting ultra-fast electron diffraction. And there you need charges on the order of around 150 coulombs or less, and bunch lengths that are 10 femtoseconds long or less in order to make a real impact in the field. Um, eventually, we'd like to actually operate these kinds of accelerators at higher charge and higher current, perhaps doing things like X-ray generation or even high current, high luminosity machines that might be applicable for high energy physics. Okay. Time here a little bit. Um, so, uh, a little bit about the history uh, of accelerators. The modern RF accelerator really uh, was born around World War II um, and came about because of uh, two critical inventions, both which um, actually have their roots here uh, in the Bay Area. Um, so, on the right, you're actually seeing one of the first uh, klystrons uh, that was built by the Bering brothers. Um, uh, this was actually motivated uh, during World War II for the need for high frequency, high power amplifiers uh, and the use of radar systems. So we use that same technology to power our accelerators. Um, and then on the left, <coughs> you're actually seeing one of the first um, RF accelerators uh, developed at the, uh, by William Hansen and my colleagues um, at Stanford. Uh, and this work turned into what is now uh, SLAC. So this, these are really the precursors in terms of the accelerating structures. Uh, for the machine that parts of which are still in uh, operation today. So it's had a really uh, long and productive life. So what's actually going on in an accelerator? Um, well, you're trying to give energy to a particle, and we do that through the Lorentz force. We apply uh, a longitudinal electric field, usually in a copper structure with an alternating uh, RF frequency wave, and you send your particle through and with the correct phasing uh, between that electron or a charged particle, uh, and the RF wave, you gain energy. And the most common picture that people use to describe that is the surfers catching the wave. If you get onto the wave, uh, in order to become synchronous with it, you need to start at the correct time and with the correct velocity. And that's what you're doing when you're designing an accelerating structure. And here's a picture of the actual structure that's being used uh, for LCLS2, right, or excuse me, LCLS right now. Um, it's a copper structure. And originally, for the high energy physics experiments, it was a full two miles of this uh, that was bringing the beam up to about 50 GB in those days. But there's much more uh, that goes into accelerators, not just the structures. Today, um, the talk itself will probably focus primarily on that, or will focus primarily on that. Uh, but you start out with something like a power supply or a modulator, you produce a high voltage pulse. Um, and that's a DC pulse, you need to turn that into an electromagnetic wave. That's where your klystron comes in, or your RF power source. You send that power into uh, an accelerating structure at the same time that you're injecting a charged particle beam. We're usually talking about electrons uh, for ultra-fast experiments, but there's lots of different uh, options that are uh, available. You can do positrons, protons, neutrons, ions. <clears throat> and then you either use those particles directly uh, or you use them to, to generate something else, a photon, an extra that you want to use for your experiment. Okay, so now I'll move on to talking a little bit about um, the performance that we are trying to get with our turrets accelerators. So, <clears throat> I mentioned this issue of gradient. Um, so right now, most accelerators operate in around 30 megavolt per meter range. So that means you gain 30 MeV in one meter of structure. And that's actually pretty low in terms of uh, the energies that we're trying to reach with a lot of these facilities. Okay, we're trying to get up to the scale of 10 gig electron volts uh, for generating x-rays. So 
So you're talking about kilometer long facilities, and this really limits the places where you can imagine having them. So why are we limited by that uh, field? Well, it's because of the onset of breakdown uh, or high voltage discharge um, in your structure. And empirically, it's, it's been found that this breakdown voltage or the field that you can tolerate in your structure scales roughly as the square root of frequency. Um, and this has really been now demonstrated to hold into the terahertz frequency range. So there's a variety of experiments um, that I'm showing here that have reached different field gradients. For example, this was with the laser-driven terahertz pulses that produced a few hundred megavolts per meter on the surface. This was a beam-driven experiment where you send a high charge punch through. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. That got up to gigavolts per meter on the surface. Um, and then here another laser-driven experiment that got uh, around 150 megavolts per meter on the surface. So you can get significantly higher uh, fields on surfaces once you push up into this frequency range. And it's really two factors that are at play. One is the shorter pulse length. So if you're talking about a lower frequency structure, in order to reach high gradient, you have to put in power for a long period of time, around a microsecond. Here you can do it in a nanosecond, or even less. Um, and that's one of the advantages that you have. The second is that the fields are alternating much faster, and so it's harder for uh, things like multi-factor to occur in your structures. But there's other advantages with going up in frequency besides achieving higher gradients. So um, what we're concerned about in a lot of cases is something called shunt impedance, which is just a measure of how much power do I need to put into my accelerating structure in order to establish the fields in it. And this, if you take the same structure that you designed, for example, at 1 gigahertz and scale it up uh, in frequency, that shunt impedance um, scales as the square root of frequency. So you need considerably less power if you can go up a couple orders of uh, magnitude and frequency. The other critical parameter is that because the radius of this structure is decreasing as you go up in frequency, you actually have a lot less stored energy in your structure. So if you do trigger a breakdown event, there's a lot less energy in there for you to damage uh, your structure with. And so they process up much faster in terms of the gradient which you operate at. So our focus right now is right, right around here, around uh, 0.1 terahertz or 100 gigahertz where we're fabricating structures and testing them at high gradient. And then we have programs where we're developing both sources and structures a little bit higher in frequency, around 300. And we kind of think that this is the optimal uh, in terms of uh, fabrication technology, uh, source development, and then what kinds of beams that we're interested in getting. So I'd like to also show this because it gives you kind of a direct comparison between some of the key parameters. Uh, if you say, OK, let's look at this uh, single cell standing wave structure here compare between 3 and 300 gigahertz. And what you'll see is obviously the stored energy per cell, dramatic difference. The quality factor actually drops because your conductivity gets a little bit worse, but this leads to faster fill times, um, which actually ends up helping you in the end. Uh, you see that uh, shunt impedance higher by an order of magnitude. And what all of this combines to give you is, in fact, that shorter fill time and those reduced losses. And this is another very interesting thing because it allows you to operate your structure at a much, much higher repetition rate. So a lot of the experiments that we're doing, we're sending less than a million electrons onto a sample and then collecting an image with a detector. We can do single shot imaging even with a million electrons. But the statistics that you're getting from your diffraction are very low. So you win uh, uh, exactly by the repetition. Okay? You can integrate over many, many shots. So having high repetition rate is really important for the future uh, development of these uh, experiments. In fact, LCLS right now is running at 120 hertz. And they're making a huge investment to go to a superconductor <coughs> because it can run at a megahertz repetition. Now, there are some things that don't scale so well in frequency. Um, and the main thing uh, that we're concerned about is, in fact, the conductivity of our materials. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, surface temperature rise in an accelerator um, actually does cause damage because of something called large pulse heating. So this is uh, an effect where you have very intense currents on the surface of your material. The skin depth is very shallow, and so the temperature on the surface rises dramatically. And by dramatically, I mean 50 degrees Celsius, except that uh, it does this over a couple hundred nanometers. So the stress in the material is quite high, between 50 and 100 megapascals. And this cyclic stress results in fatigue, uh, and cyclic fatigue and failure of the material. So if you first look at this and say, okay, my, my surface sensitivity uh, is increasing, this is a real problem for uh, the accelerating structures. But you can compensate for this because you have the shorter fill time. Uh, 
Um, so actually, here are some pictures of that kind of damage. And what I'm showing is, once again, that 3 versus 300 gigahertz structure. And you see the dramatic difference in fill time. You go from 2 microseconds down to 2 nanoseconds. And if you look at the temperature rise on that surface, it's actually lower for the higher frequency structure, even though the conductivity of the material was worse. That's because that Q factor is also dropping. So we need to operate in sort of new, very new regimes, very short pulses, nanosecond time scales, but we can still do it at very high repetition rates uh, and, and get the number of uh, particles delivered to the sample level. Okay, so then, uh, you know, I think all of this is, uh, you know, is the motivation behind doing the work, and we're just starting to see now the first results that are indicating that it's really possible to do these things. Um, so there was an experiment done in Slack a couple of years ago, um, actually using a, another accelerator facility called FACET, that can produce very high charge electron bunches. When you send a very high charge electron bunch through an accelerating structure, you produce something called a wake field. So this is the particles themselves radiating an arc field as they pass through. And in this experiment, it was designed so that the weight would be very strong and it would produce very high fields in the structure. And they were able to show that the structure survived getting up to gigavolt per meter fields. There were some, uh, some damage due to breakdown, but there, were also significant, there was also a significant amount of damage done uh, from the electron beam hitting the structure. Because the accelerator that was used to power this doesn't really have the stability required for, this, uh, for structures that are this small. It kind of shows you the mismatch between existing technology today and what we're trying to do. Uh, but the damage that was done by the uh, electron beam uh, and the halo of that electron beam is really kind of clouding the physics that's at play in the structure. Um, so one of the things that's pushing us forward now is actually trying to understand what's the real scaling uh, in frequency in terms of breakdown physics and cheap gradient, trying to understand how can we make these structures and what kind of beams do we need to generate to put through them. Um, so I'll start off now by describing a little bit, uh, or I'll go in actually in quite a bit of detail about uh, some of these experiments uh, that we're doing at MIT, but the goal here is really to demonstrate that achievable gradient uh, in a uh, millimeter wave or terahertz accelerating structure, and do that with an independent uh, terahertz source uh, that doesn't uh, cloud our results. And we're trying to do it in a way where we can make a direct comparison with X-band breakdown studies, because this has been something that has been studied for many years, uh, in particular at SLAC and CERN, INFN, and, and KK in Japan, uh, where they looked at uh, accelerating structures around 10 gigahertz uh, to see what's the physics at play in these devices and to really understand how to make them correctly. And if you uh, look in that literature, this is sort of the hallmark of the structures that were uh, used in study where they maximize the field in a central cell um, and then operate the structure at high gradients to see how it behaves and then they change materials they start changing geometries to understand its behavior so we really want to make a direct comparison with that data so what you're seeing is the realization of that structure in the top photo but as you zoom in in fact the structure is very tiny so this is a few millimeters long okay. now in, in addition to uh, Exploring the physics of these structures at high gradient. Uh, of course, this means uh, developing a whole new uh, suite of technology um, that allows you to power these structures. So, if you're familiar at all with uh, accelerators and you look at this, you'd say, oh my gosh, this is a completely different approach uh, to a mode converter that can actually power an accelerating structure. And in fact, we're using free space Gaussian beams and converting those into accelerating TM01 modes. So, it's been a really interesting process. Uh, developing that um, as we go. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about how we actually build these structures now. Um, so how you uh, assemble the structure uh, is a, a critical indicator of the final performance that you can get. Because you're trying to hit uh, frequency, you're trying to get a field balance in your cabinet, um, and you're trying to machine the structure uh, in a way that doesn't leave protrusions or, or uh, artifacts that can lead to uh, breakdown in the structure. So we've gone through uh, a whole host of studies where we built prototypes of these cavities. As you can see, they're sort of on the uh, scale of the pen tip. Um, and then we uh, studied different techniques for assembling them and, and fabricating them in order to understand their behavior. Um, so different things that we looked at, have looked at, for example, are diffusion bonding. And one of the uh, 
the examples that's shown here, um, actually you see a problem. So if you bring two halves together, um, and it leaves a gap where the iris is. So there's actually a deformation of irises when they're this small and you apply high pressure, and you don't get a smooth joint across. Um, and then we looked at brazing of these structures, and you can see you start to get uh, a slightly more reasonable um, uh, performance in terms of uh, getting that nice semicircular uh, iris that you should be seeing in the picture. And then by really controlling the process, now you're getting a smooth joint across. So as we're going, we're starting to develop the ability to fabricate the structures at these frequencies. So a little bit more about the process that's shown on the right. Here you're seeing an SEM uh, of half of those cavities. And what we're doing is we're actually laser machining uh, copper gold brace foil uh, that lays down and matches the dimension that we want to have uh, in the final product. Alignment is not so critical because the foil itself melts and wicks to the correct location, but in particular the volume that you have there is the uh, dominant parameter in how the uh, structure ends up. And what you see when you have it all uh, tuned up correctly is it looks like somebody went in there and just welded this joint show. So it's been a, a process learning how to actually make these structures. And then it's not just the cavity itself, uh, but you're of course also machining the mode converter. So here we're converting from a Gaussian beam down into a TM01 mode. Um, and there's problems with this as well because uh, in most accelerators what you do is you machine them uh, and you raise a pin onto it and then you go in and you hook it up to a network analyzer and you see what the frequency is. And if the frequency is too low, you hit the pin with a hammer. So you can't really do that when you're talking about something that's in this frequency range. So what we're actually doing is we, we image the cabins um, after we've machined them, uh, and then we model uh, what the frequency of the structure is going to be, and what the field distribution is in the cavities. And then we actually go back and remachine the surface if needed in order to balance out the fields and correct for the balance. <coughs> So we've had to come up with new techniques, also how to make the structures, how to tune the structures, and, and then the end result is putting it all together and seeing how it works. So we'll move on and talk a little bit about those uh, experiments and where we are. Um, so the very first thing that we did is we actually ran these structures in reverse. Um, so there's a diagnostic port uh, down here that samples the field in the cavity, uh, but if you put a millimeter wave source on this end, you can actually radiate the field out of the structure. And what we did is we mapped out uh, the field at different Z locations uh, from the aperture of the horn to see what the field distribution is. And what you can see is you get a very nice Gaussian profile and a very flat uh, phase front on that measurement. And what that's telling you is if I propagate this back, I'm actually, in fact, producing a very nice Gaussian beam from this one. So this was the first indication that the structures were working um, as desired. Um, and then you flip the structure around and you actually power it the way that you're supposed to. Um, so this is a, a rectangular waveguide uh, source that then gets converted into a Gaussian beam uh, with an uptaper and a horn and then a dielectric filter here to filter out some of the higher order mode content. And then the assembly that I was showing you on the previous page, this one here, uh, is over here on the right except we've added a lens down in front of it. So the lens is focusing that Gaussian beam down onto the back to sliding. So you see the intensity of the fields are, are increasing as you get closer to the point. That requires the placement of the lens right in front of this window. So then we use this setup here on the network analyzer to see what the structure itself is doing. Uh, and you're seeing the result over here on the right. So there's three resonances. This is the O mode, pi over 2, and pi mode. Uh, and this is the accelerating mode. So we're coupling well into the accelerating mode. Um, and then critically, we're actually seeing this is that diagnostic port, which is measuring the transmitted power. And it's right at minus 42 dB, which was actually the design value. So extremely pleased with that result. So we have a calibrated measurement now of both uh, how well we're coupling power into the structure, as well as what the fields uh, in the cavities actually are. And this was you know, a nice result. This is the first time that we've done uh, any quasi-optical coupling into an airband accelerating structure. Um, and then you're ready for your high power test. So it's one thing to put low power, put you know, around a milliwatt into your structure. Uh, it's another uh, question if you can put almost a megawatt into your structure. Um, so we're doing this work in here in collaboration uh, with our old group at MIT. Um, so there's a megawatt uh, pulse to gyrotron, which is not shown in this picture. But it produces a few microsecond uh, megawatt pulse 
uh, and as I mentioned, we want to be on the 10 nanosecond time scale or below. Um, so microsecond pulses are actually way too long for us. Um, so the, the uh, pulse comes in here. This is a very attenuator. Um, and then we use a silicon wafer at Brewster's angle. Uh, we hit it with a laser pulse to make it conductive. And that lasts for about 10 or 20 nanoseconds, depending on the mode of operation. And you chop out a portion of the pulse and send that over to the structure. Uh, so our colleagues at MIT did a really great job uh, getting this set, this set up. We have variable power that we can send into the structure. And we've now started putting power into the structure. Um, you can see a pulse that's measured here, the forward pulse, and then uh, uh, the blue dots are actually uh, uh, the measurements for the power that's transmitted uh, through the structure. And then the black curve is what you would simulate with the forward power pulse. So we get very good agreement between the pulse that we're sending to the structure and what we're actually measuring through it. And then a sample trace of the gradient is shown over here. Um, the slide's a little old. We've actually gotten up to 150 megavolts per meter now. Um, and we're continuing to go up in power. So far, we've been limited to 250 kilowatts. Uh, but eventually, we're hoping to get to full megawatt or even more, which is what Samantha means for her thesis. So. Um, and in fact, we do see breakdowns. Um, so, so far, the breakdowns that we've seen in the structure quickly process <coughs> So most accelerating structures, what you do is you first turn them on. As you're increasing the gradient, you do see breakdowns, but that's usually due to some gas that's absorbed on the surface or some filament that was left during the machine. And those are, are indic um, the indicative signature of that is that you get a few breakdowns, but then the back gradient, you no longer see breakdown. So, so far, up to 150 megavolts per meter, uh, that's been the behavior of the structure, and we'll continue to push it higher in gradient until we get more to the statistical breakdown regime. Uh, and that's where we're actually starting to have some of these pulse heating effects that I mentioned earlier. But the experiment so far looks um, very intriguing, and we're very pleased with uh, those results. So the other uh, portion of, uh, of the talk that I want to have is discussing a little bit about actually uh, accelerating structures that are now powered with uh, terahertz pulses that are produced from laser systems. So there's two directions that we're looking at going in here. Uh, the one we've uh, had a considerable amount of effort in is using uh, single cycle terahertz sources. <coughs> the reason for that is they're very readily available and can get to very high peak powers. It's routine to get 20 megawatts peak power in a single cycle terahertz pulse. Um, the disadvantage of those is that they're very broadband, and so the structures that you have don't have the same efficiency that you do with the narrowband structure. So we're actually working on the development of narrowband terahertz sources as well. Uh, with some colleagues, and eventually uh, we want to power those to high gradient. So this work is uh, definitely more in its preliminary stage, but I'll show you some of the results we've had so far uh, with our single cycle work. Um, so in particular, what I'll discuss is an experiment that uh, actually just concluded yesterday uh, that we did at Slack, and what we were doing was a measurement of uh, electron bunch compression uh, in uh, the UED facility um, that I showed at the beginning of the talk. And the goal there is to take a few mega electron volt electron bunch uh, out of an, the RF gun and reduce that bunch length and reduce that timing jitter to actually improve the beam that can be delivered uh, for the UED setup. So we do that by first going through a compression stage where we uh, provide a chirp to the electron bunch. We change the velocity of the, uh, the head and make that uh, lower so it slows down long at the compressor and then it will compress as it approaches the sample get very, very short pulses. But we want to prove that that's what's happening, so we actually use a transverse deflector, also powered by a terahertz source, um, that's highly synchronized because it comes from the same laser system, so there's less than a fact a second uh, of timing jitter between the two of those. And you can make a very precise measurement uh, of, uh, of the bunch um, that's actually arriving at your sample location. Um, so here's a little schematic that shows what's actually going on. Um, and this is the phase space of the electron bunch as it arrives. Uh, typically, what comes out of the RF gun has uh, slightly higher energy in the front of the electron bunch and slightly lower energy at the back. Um, that's due to space charge forces that are causing the beam to spread apart. And then what we want to do is send it through a structure. We're using these parallel plate waveguide structures because they don't have any dispersion. And we send a single cycle terahertz pulse that has a very high peak power. And we use the longitudinal electric field uh, that's in the z direction here uh, and synchronize it to the electron bunch as it goes through. 
And what happens is you flip that trip. So you lower the energy uh, of the head, and raise the energy of the tail, and allow it to drift uh, about a meter. And then these particles catch up at the front, and those slow down to the middle. So you get a very short electron bunch of time. So we went through a, a rather extensive design process for this. One of the critical uh, items here is, once again, that you're trying to couple a Gaussian into a structure uh, and interact with the electron bunch. So it comes down to the question of mode conversion and how well you can actually match the source that you have. Uh, so we designed these parabolic horns uh, for coupling the Gaussian beam from the laser source and doing a very good job. And what you're seeing here is some of the issues you can run into. If you have the wrong waist, uh, you get strong reflections. Uh, from the surface, and these are this is a bad thing to happen because you can also get mode conversion, you can get multiple modes running around. So you have to be very careful about how you design this one and exactly how you match the optics that uh, go into the structure. And then what do you see? Well, here's some modeling for that structure. What you're seeing is the energy uh, change in the pulse uh, as a function of time, um, so we're, uh, and as a function of uh, three different energies here, between one and ten microjoules. Uh, from the terraformers. So what you want is you want this linear region where you have a nice linear slope and the energy change that you get so you can in fact flip that chirp. And then uh, for those various cases, actually I'm sorry, on the right it's just showing it for the 10 microjoule case um, and you're seeing different initial bunch lengths and you see how those get compressed down. Um, so the design and modeling, we've gone ahead and we built the structure um, and you can see what it looks like here. So. For scale, the vertical dimension of this is about uh, one centimeter, and then the terahertz pulse itself comes in here, and the electron bunch that you're going to compress is coming in through this hole on the side, and then the distribution would travel down uh, to the sample. And then, uh, you know, before I continue uh, talking about the results of that, you have, you have to mention just a little bit about how we're actually going to measure the bunch length. So what we do is we actually send this through a transverse deflector. Uh, that's also a parallel plate waveguide structure, but that's turned on its side. Um, it's a very short structure. It's actually a rectangular slit, not this butterfly that's shown here. What I have is a little video like, um, that will show the electron bunch. So what you're seeing here is the electron bunch in X and Y on the detector. And the movie will change the delay between the uh, electron bunch and the arrival time of the terahertz pulse. So first, first what you're going to see is that the electron bunch gets deflected, it starts to go down, so you're giving a perpendicular kick, and now it's going to get stretched out. This is your measurement of the bunch length. So what you're seeing is that linear chirp that you get it, uh, linear deflection that you give it as a function of the arrival time. Um, so we published a paper, well actually the paper itself just came out in January, uh, where we performed this experiment and you're actually able to measure the, uh, uh, the length uh, of your electron bunch with femtosecond precision. Uh, and we studied this in depth and we we're actually able to see because of, because of the strength of the slope and then the resolution of your detector, one pixel on this detector corresponds to a delay of 1.4 femtoseconds. So you're getting very precise measurements uh, of what the charge density is and how long your electron bunch is. And so in this recent experiment, what we did is we brought the terahertz compressor and the terahertz uh, deflector together in order to do this measurement. And these are just some results from uh, last week. And not the best ones yet, I hope, but uh, they definitely show the effect uh, that we're looking for. Um, so this view is actually rotated from the previous image. Um, but what you're seeing here is the bunch going through the compressor uh, that has already gone through the compressor and is now being streaked. So you're seeing the bunch length with the compressor off. This is the elongation phase, so where you're putting the chirp in the uh, wrong direction and you see the bunches get longer, get wider. It starts to develop these tails because there's a little bit of a uh, a long, uh, excuse me, transverse kick that the compressor gives when the bunch is long. And then on the right, you're actually seeing the compressed electron bunch. Uh, so you're seeing the width of it is shorter. And you can, you can compare these uh, uh, transverse beam profiles uh, and see that this is, in fact, quite a bit shorter than the one on the left. Uh, so, so far, with the data we've analyzed, we're seeing a three times compression and a three times uh, reduction in the timing jitter. 
uh, that you have. So what happens with the timing jitter is that if the bunch arrives late, then the mean energy kick you give it is a little bit higher. So the whole bunch arrives a little bit earlier. So you're actually correcting for some of the error in uh, the synchronization between the RF um, and the laser system. So both of those directly impact the quality of the measurement that you can do. And so what we're producing now are bunches that are uh, around 20 femtoseconds long with around 10 femtosecond time jitter. And here you're just seeing data over a uh, thousand shots that's used to produce them. So it's a fairly stable uh, system. And it's really, I think, going to deliver some uh, unique performance to the users. And we have some ideas on how to improve it in the future. Yeah, so just one last slide here saying where are we going next in the laser-driven uh, arena. Well, what I showed you uses a pulse that's a picosecond long. Uh, and what I showed you before was using something that's 10 nanoseconds long. And we don't think that either of those are really the right answer. We think that the right answer is somewhere between, between 100 picoseconds and a nanosecond. And there's techniques that can be used in uh, laser sources to, do, to uh, deliver that, uh, but they definitely need some work in order to get to some of the peak power requirements also starting to develop the structures that have very short fill times so that they can operate in that regime, but also have strong interaction with the electron bunch uh, over useful distances. Okay, so in conclusion, I think we've shown that we're achieving uh, very high fields in our structure. Depending on the experiment, we've gotten up to gigavolt per meter fields. I think now we're starting to really develop uh, an understanding of that performance and how we fabricate those structures. Um, and now, uh, we've also recently shown this demonstration of quasi-optical coupling that you can do it efficiently, which is a critical parameter. You don't want to make that terahertz and then waste it. Um, and then, you know, in the future, there still are needs. So the need, I think, that's clear uh, uh, for us is the need to develop these high-power, high-frequency sources in these new regimes, sort of 100 picosecond to nanosecond range, where we think that the structures themselves would work the best. Thank you. Any questions? So, um, various. Um, so usually for the fields themselves, we use a code called HSS. Um, and then I, we have our like, own simple scripts for actually tracking particles at like, one particle at a time through the structure to get an estimate of the performance. And then sort of the standards now are Carmela, GPT, and Astro that are used for uh, uh, simulating codes like on PC scale. Um, and then if we really want to do a good job of using like impact, uh, which is actually from our friends, rivals up to him, um, that, that those can run on things like mesh and, and can solve very complicated problems. So we use, um, let me jump back. Uh, so uh, we use CNC MLs to fabricate these structures. Um, one of the nice things is we use this split cell approach. So we try to make everything out of just two pieces, um, which has a, a, a very strong advantage because the surface currents themselves um, actually run parallel to the joint, so the joint quality in terms of its conductivity is not a critical performance indicator. So you can actually just put the two things together by hand um, and get a very good estimate of what the quality factors can be. It won't improve by more than, uh, let's say, even 10% after you go through the bonding. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's all computer-controlled uh, computer CNC. What about like, the, the microwave structure? Uh, which one's in? Like a 300 gigahertz one. So that's also CNC. We're starting, yeah, so all that CNC, everything we've delivered in practice has been CNC. Uh, actually, though, I had a picture. We are starting to look a little bit, for example, at printing in plastic uh, and then doing coating. The issue that, uh, so this approach seems like it has a lot of potential. So this was done with a nanostripe, uh, which is a two photon. 
3D printer and polymer. The issue is that this starts to be doable at 300 gigahertz. If you're lower in frequency than that, it is not practical just because the volume is too large. Um, but we have done it at 300 and it has worked at 300, uh, we believe. Uh, so the idea is print some plastic, coat with metal, electroform, and then etch away the plastic. We've never tested anything that we've made that way at high gradient, but we're hoping to do that. Even then though, even at 300, this is kind of the size you're talking about making. So you have to figure out how am I going to interface this with the mode converter to actually power the structure. So that's an open question. You'd want to probably use traditional machine for that. Um, but yeah, otherwise everything we do is, is, is CNC machining. And even for the for these parallel plate gear grade structures. I didn't really get into that machining. That was also an adventure. Um, but yeah, you see, it's, once again, it's that kind of made into two times. It's really nice because you can do the same machine put it together, see how it works, and take it apart, and machine it again.